Jumping the shark is a term typically reserved for TV when a series changes in a significant way which usually has negative reactions from the fans. In many ways, it's a death knell that rings out for everyone involved that the show creatively has run its course. It's a noise that I actually hear quite a lot at What Culture Towers, but you know what I do? I just wad the thing up with toilet paper and just carry on doing the same list for another three years. And yes, I'm very self-aware of the fact. And yes, you are welcome. The phrase has its lineage in the now infamous Happy Days episode where the Fonz literally jumps over a shark on jet skis. Yet you know what? Even though the act was a tired attempt to get kids interested in the show again, he did jump over a bloody shark which is actually pretty impressive. And sometimes this act isn't the be-all and end-all. As occasionally shows can come back from the brink of mediocrity with the help of some shrewd course corrections. So for a man who's always jumping after he's pushed, I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are nine TV shows that recovered from jumping the shark. Number 9. Community Community's first three seasons were beloved by fans and critics alike, widely praised for their superb ensemble cast, witty sense of humour, and uncommonly left-field approach to sitcom storytelling. However, disaster struck when creator Dan Harmon was fired after season three, following extensive conflicts between the reportedly difficult Harmon and NBC representatives. The result was a fourth season that didn't have a clue what it was doing, and tried to ape Harmon's distinctive style, giving it a tonally different feel in the process. The season was largely savaged by heartbroken fans, and it was long believed that this would be all she wrote for the series. However, thanks to the extreme backlash, NBC saw sense and rehired Harmon for season 5, which was a major return to form and hilariously pawned off the previous season's issues, namely the inconsistent character behaviours, on a gas leak. Number 8. True Detective True Detective's first season is one of the greatest TV volumes of the entire decade, a deliciously taut, intelligent and provocative procedural elevated by Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson's outstanding performances. Season 2 sensibly opted to tell a totally different story, but in a classic case of a creator taking the wrong lesson away from their own successes, the crew decided to dial up the pretentious philosophizing and quasi-Shakespeare dialogue to 12 for Vince Vaughn, Colin Farrell and Rachel McAdams. It wasn't terrible, but it felt more like a parody of True Detective than an actual second batch of episodes, and it was full to the brim with silly, almost cringeworthy dialogue. Thankfully, the recent third season was one of the most impressive reversals of fortune that any prestige show has seen in years, and that was thanks to relying on what made the show great originally, character work and an actually entrancing mystery. Number 7. The Wire the Wire is unquestionably one of the greatest drama series of all time. However, that's not to say that it was always the smoothest of rides. Take for example the fifth season, which centred around Jimmy taking drastic measures after the homicide unit has had its funding cut, ultimately leading to him fabricating the existence of a serial killer in Baltimore in order to get his team some more money. Though the performances are still great, it was one plot line too silly for a show roundly praised for its strident realism. And the other subplot involving the newsroom was… Well, to put it plainly, just a bit boring. Thankfully, the show's creator David Simon managed to pull the show back from the brink for its series finale, which resolved the serial killer storyline relatively satisfyingly and, more importantly, ended the show with an absolutely unsentimental but brutally honest note about how little things actually change. Number 6. Red Dwarf Red Dwarf is one of the greatest British comedies ever made and uncommonly only seemed to get better as it went along, culminating in the show peaking with its excellent sixth series. But series 7 was hobbled by a number of disappointing creative changes. Co-creator and writer Rob Grant left the show, Chris Barry only returned for half the series, and Lister's love interest was brought in as a totally lacklustre replacement. In addition to the series turning in a depressingly low number of major laughs, many fans were also frustrated by the decision to ditch the studio audience format and opt for a new cinematic style which was far away from the kitschy lo-fi aesthetic that they had grown to love. Series 8 similarly left fans underwhelmed and even when Red Dwarf finally returned for 2009's Back to Earth revival, it still felt like the magic was gone. But 2012's Red Dwarf X was finally a return to form, resurrecting the show's original four-man formula and also being filmed in front of a studio audience once again. It's never going to be as good as it was back then, but it approached the tenth season with a sense of humility, which paid off a lot more than its grander budget was trying to do all those years prior. Number 5. Twin Peaks 
Twin Peaks' first season is one of the most iconic and rapidly discussed pieces of TV, and that is all thanks to the brilliant and uniquely bizarre tone that David Lynch provides. But despite Lynch feeling that the killer of Laura Palmer should never be revealed, Network ABC pressured him to reveal her murderer early on in season two, leading to the flatly underwhelming revelation that her possessed father was actually the culprit. Interest in the show dwindled soon thereafter, and without its central mystery anchor, the sillier storylines seemed even more adrift. Things weren't helped by the fact that the second season had 22 episodes, which was totally overblown, all things considered. But then, Twin Peaks made its long awaited return in 2017 with its third season, The Return, which Lynch and co creator Mark Frost were able to conceive without any creative intervention from network Showtime. The results were as brilliantly singular as anything Lynch has ever made, deepening the series' lore and character work, and basically felt like compensation for slogging through Peaks' turgid second season all those years ago. Number 4. Friday Night Lights Peter Berg's Friday Night Lights came swinging out of the gate with a terrific first season, which smartly avoided sports drama cliches and offered a clever story with a remarkable cast. And yet, despite season 1 being praised as one of the best new series of 2006, season 2 was crippled by both the infamous WGA writer's strike, which trimmed the episode order down by almost a third, and an uptick in off-puttingly silly soap opera-esque storylines. For example, Landry ends up killing an attempted rapist and disposing of his body, which is a storyline which cast an incredibly dark shadow over the entire season, and it's effectively ignored for the remainder of the runtime. Thankfully, the rest of the show's run was near enough back to the quality of season one. Circling back to the poignant examination of small-town America that made it so acclaimed in the first place. Number 3. Homeland Homeland's first season was one of the most acclaimed of the last decade, cementing the show as a more current, more complex version of 24, and was topped by fantastic performances from Claire Danes and Damian Lewis. Now, there's a lot of debate about precisely when Homeland jumped the shark. Some say it's when the CIA was bombed at the end of season two, others say that it's the show's third season melodrama involving Brody's daughter Dana, but many can agree that Brody's subsequent execution at the end of season three was a choice that felt completely overboard. And yet, with Brody gone, season 4 was actually able to focus squarely on Carrie, and the show found itself a renewed sense of urgency, doubling down on the spy games and tradecraft that fans loved about season 1, while pushing the iffy melodrama to the periphery. Subsequent seasons similarly took a less soapy, more self-contained approach, and though it never quite got back to the brilliance of season 1, it is a far cry away from the mounting silliness of seasons 2 and 3. Number 2. Six Feet Under Six Feet Under is one of the most artful and achingly human TV dramas ever made, and for its first three seasons was a beautiful reflection on the fragility of everything we know and trust. But the show's fourth season took on an oddly melodramatic turn following the death of Nate's wife Lisa at the end of season three. This culminated in the season finale's implication that she was murdered by a minor character, her brother-in-law Hoyt, totally out of nowhere. And to make things even more soap opera-y, he ended up shooting himself. That's not to forget season four's subplot involving teen pop star Celeste, which is an embarrassing letdown across the board and actually kind of reflects the entire season as a whole. But thankfully, the show recovered hugely for its brilliant fifth and final season, which gave the Fishers as affecting a send-off as anyone could have expected. And number one, The West Wing. The West Wing was so thoroughly defined by Aaron Sorkin's political barb that it's little surprise that the show suffered through a major downturn once he left at the end of season four. Season five was a mere shadow of what came before, lacking the biting humor and coherent character work that earmarked its best seasons, replaced it and being replaced instead with icky melodrama and a desperate attempt to recreate Sorkin's dialogue. Now, hilariously, the writer himself said that the new regime was like watching someone make out with his wife. But thankfully, after a relatively rocky season, sixth season, The West Wing returned to something approaching solid form for its seventh and final batch of episodes, doubling down on the president politics and pithy humour that fans absolutely loved about the Sorkin years. Did it fully recapture the glory of the first four seasons? No. But the charm and energy that had been severely lacking through season five and much of season six was mercifully restored. And there we go, those were nine TV shows that recovered from Jumping the Shark. I hope that you enjoyed that, my friends. Please let me know your thoughts down below. But before you go off and hopefully enjoy your great day, I just want to say something on the concept of Jumping the Shark. Sometimes we feel that we might have gone too far, overextended ourselves, burned ourselves out. And that is a very common thing that happens nowadays. People push themselves way too hard and don't realize when they need to take a break. So do me a favor today, if you can, stop and actually listen to what your body is telling you. It might be saying to you that it needs a break. 
It might be saying that it needs help. It might be saying that you are wasting a lot of potential energy trying to change something that you cannot actually affect. Once you realize this and find ways of putting your energy out there in a more positive and structured form, you might find that your goals are much easier to achieve. And don't forget, there is help out there if you need it. Friends, family, and support professionals in the industry. Each of them cares about you and wants you to succeed. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me at RetroJ with a zero over on Twitter. And if you'd like to check out something a bit different, I also run a board game channel over here on YouTube, which is called Live and Let's Die. So it'd be fantastic to see you over there because it's just a bit of fun that I do outside of the work time. And as always, you have been awesome. Never forget that. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye.